Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Mondays with Mundy. That's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. This episode is being broadcast on Monday, April the 25th, and in two days on April 27th, the Union League and the entire country will be celebrating the 200th birthday of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, everybody thinks of Grant as the, the military savior of the Union during the Civil War, and he was. He was also the president of the United States. Right, the 17th president after Andrew Johnson. Uh, but nobody really thinks much or knows much about Grant, Philadelphia, and the Union League. So here we go. We're going to find some out, some, some stuff out. So let's take a look at that relationship and see what it, what it turned out to be like. I think it's going to be more interesting than you realize. So let me share the ubiquitous PowerPoint. Okay. Do that. I got to do that. And then we do that. Hot diggity dogs. Okay, we got it. All right. So let's begin our little episode on U.S. Grant and the Union League. All right. And of course, this is what the Union League looked like in, uh, after it was uh, opened in 1865. And it opened on May the 11th of 1865. And uh, the war had just ended on April the 9th with Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. And Already by the end of the year in December, the league had given a reception to Grant, obviously in honor of the successful conclusion of the Civil War itself. Regretfully, we have no uh, evidence of that uh, in the archival collection, but we had some other good stuff as well. Now, during the war uh, in 1863, now keep in mind that the league was organized on December 27th of 1862, but in 1863, the league awarded its first medal, a gold medal to Abraham Lincoln, and then subsequently it awarded silver medals to all of the ranking military figures in the Union Army, major generals specifically, and U.S. Grant was one of them. And so this is the this is not the medal he had received, but a model of the medal that was distributed to all these generals uh, in 1863. So that's pretty neat. And then in 1860, actually December of 1864, Union League member uh, George A. Stewart, who uh, was the president and one of the founders of the United States Christian Commission at the beginning of the war, and also of the United States Sanitary Commission, two of the most important, probably the two most important philanthropic uh, agencies of the United of the government, right, and both private and government agencies. Uh, to work in support of the soldiers during the war itself. And so Stewart uh, was a nationally recognized Philadelphian. He was also an early, early member of the Union League. And he happened to be in City Point, Virginia in December of 1864, visiting Grant at his headquarters at City Point. When, as he was leaving, he just asked Grant, is there anything I can do for you in Philadelphia? And Grant said offhand, no, not really, but thanks for asking. And before Stewart was out the door, Grant said, Mr. Stewart, you know, maybe there is something you can do. You know, um, my wife has been trying to find a house, in a furnished house in Philadelphia. Uh, and she was living in Burlington, New Jersey at that point. He said, but, you know, um, she's having some difficulty finding one. So any help there would be appreciated. And Stewart took that uh, a little further than Grant intended. Because when Stewart got back to Philadelphia, he immediately talked with other Union League members, uh, especially the bankers and financiers, such as Anthony J. Drexel, J. Cook, and of course, George W. Childs. And they created a plan where they would actually buy the Grants a house in Philadelphia. And uh, so Stewart sent Grant a letter saying that our intention is to provide you a house in Philadelphia, uh, furnished completely. And Grant was very, very appreciative of it, as you can imagine. And so uh, the Grants arrived in Philadelphia on May the 3rd, expecting to walk into just a furnished house. And instead, Stewart handed the Grants at a luncheon a deed to the house itself that had been bought by this group of Union League members. Uh, they paid a little over $40,000 for it, but it was completely furnished from top to bottom, uh, stem to stern, uh, you know, furniture, linens, uh, silver, I mean, everything, can, everything that the Grants needed to make this their home. And, uh, and as you can imagine, the Grants were incredibly grateful to this group of Union League members. Now, uh, the Grants did live in the house uh, for a little while, uh, but then General Grant discovered that it was incredibly difficult to commute 
between Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. by horseback or by carriage. And so uh, eventually they would leave the house and move full time to Washington, D.C. And the house itself would eventually be sold in 1885. But this is the house itself, 2009 Chestnut Street, one of the you know, uh, typical Philadelphia brick townhouses. All right. And I can see it's all decked up. And the Grants were so appreciative and General Grant himself was so appreciative that uh, in July of 1865, he arranged to have his headquarters from City Point, where all this started, sent to Philadelphia as a token of his thanks and appreciation. And this is what the cabin looks like. Right? Uh, it was placed on a bluff uh, in Fremont Park on Lemon Hill uh, in 1860, in August of 1865, and it's stayed there until the 1970s when uh, clearly a need of a better environment it was given to the National Park Service and it has been returned to City Point, Virginia, where it originally was located. So, so a neat little Philadelphia story there involving Union League members right at the, be at the end of the war itself. Now, and here we have a letter from General Grant dated June of 1865 and it's addressed to Mr. Stewart, not surprisingly, because obviously they've now become good friends. As you can see, it says, Dear Sir, I will spend the better part of next week in Philadelphia when it will be convenient for me to meet the citizens of the city and the members of the Union League in any way agreeable to them. So already, you know, the grants, the league, its members, and the city have this, this wonderful relationship that would continue for and until literally until Grant died in 1885. But this is actually, uh, and this letter is entirely in Grant's handwriting. This isn't. This was not by, done by a secretary and then signed by Grant, which was a custom back then. But this is this is Grant's actual handwriting. So pretty neat that we have that in our archival collection. So now uh, this is we have three portraits of Grant in the art collection. This one was painted from life uh, by James Reed Lambden, a member of the League. Uh, we have sixteen of his portraits in the collection. This was uh, painted in January of 1867 at Army Headquarters, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. And so this is a, an incredibly good representation of what Grant looked like at this time in his life, because things are going to change in 1867 for Grant. Um, in the fall, in September of 1867, there was a reception for Union General William Tecumseh Sherman uh, at the Union League. And one of the speakers uh, in his speech suggested that uh, with the upcoming presidential election, Grant would make a good nominee for the Republican Party. And the League took that to heart. And so at the annual meeting in December of 1867, George Gibbons, uh, one of the founding members of the League and, a, and the founder of the Republican Party in Philadelphia in 1854, nominated or made a motion to nominate U.S. Grant for president of the United States. So the League, and of course, you can imagine, it was unanimously agreed upon. And so the League became the first institution in the country to nominate U.S. Grant for president in the 1860 presidential election. All right. Now, that election was held on November the 3rd of 1868. And here we have a guest card. But actually, when Grant received the gold medal, I'm sorry, the, the silver medal uh, in 1863, he was also given what they called... Um, the pleasure of the house. That is, uh, he basically could come to the league at any time and use it if he wished. All right. So uh, clearly he did. And this was his guest card, or as you can see, visitor's card, dated October 30th of 1868. And it was good until November 30th of 1868. And in that time, on November the 3rd, he was nominated and accepted the Republican nomination for president of the United States. And of course, in the election, uh, he would go on to win. So, and again, he signed this U.S. Grant General, and that is his handwriting. So pretty neat stuff there. Now, Grant uh, knew a number of league members. Um, and by the way, this is the, uh, Grant was elected twice. And so this is the 1872 convention that was held at the Academy of Music on South Broad Street in Philadelphia. And you can see the Academy on the left-hand side, with all the flags and bunting. But if you look to the right of it, you'll see the Union League of Philadelphia right there. And the league, of course, played an important role in Grant's second nomination because in on May the 22nd, 1872, the league became the first institution again to nominate Grant for president. So the league had that honor twice, that distinction twice. 
pretty neat stuff, isn't it? All right. Uh, again, you, you know, you, you, you can't go, you can't find this history anyplace else but at the Union League of Philadelphia. All right. Now, as I was, as I was saying earlier, there were a number of Union League members who were uh, who served in Grant's cabinet or had a, uh, political appointments from Grant. So let's start with the founding member of the league, George Henry Boker. Um, Boker obviously had met Grant on a number of occasions. He was in Philadelphia and at the League House. And in 1871, at the end of his first term in office, Grant appointed Boker the minister to Constantinople, i.e. the ambassador to Turkey. And Boker had a position until 1875, when in Grant's second term in office, he would transfer, if you will, Boker uh, to Russia as the minister to Alexander II. And that appointment, Boker enjoyed a whole lot. Uh, he actually held that position until 1878 when the McKinley administration recalled Boker back to Washington, D.C., and that was the end of his diplomatic career. But nonetheless, so 1871 to 1878, George Boker served as American ambassadors to Turkey and Russia. Good stuff there. And then uh, in Grant's first administration, he appointed Adolf E. Bory on the left-hand side as his first secretary of the Navy. Now, um, Bory accepted it, thinking he would hold that position for a while, but Bory found uh, the work a lot more difficult than he thought, and he, his health wasn't in great shape. And so uh, he resigned his position on June the 25th of, of 1868. And on that same day, Ulysses S. Grant nominated another Union League member named George M. Robeson on the right to succeed Bory as Secretary of the Navy. And Robeson held that position until the end of Grant's term in office. Um, pretty good stuff there. Actually, actually, you know, long I take that back until 1877, so the beginning of the McKinley administration. Uh, Robeson was a, uh, a lawyer from Camden, New Jersey, uh, served as a general in the New Jersey militia during the Civil War. And then after his term as Secretary of the Navy, Stir, uh, became a representative from New Jersey. Uh, Bury's family were uh, merchants in Philadelphia, so, but, and, but very wealthy merchants. So, so here we have two members who served as Grant's secretaries of the Navy. Now, one of the uh, Grant's, I'm pretty sure it was his last visit to Philadelphia, was on May the 10th of 1876, after all. He, the election would be held that fall in November, and but Grant came to Philadelphia uh, to officially open the Great Centennial Exposition of 1876. And he was here on May the 10th with uh, the other important VIP, if you will, uh, Dom Pedro of Brazil. And this is the photograph of the opening day of May the 10th. There were showers early in the morning, but in the afternoon, the sun came out and the bright Philadelphia spring day. So, so Grant was here in Philadelphia again. And that night, there was a reception at the Union League for both President Grant and Don Pedro of Brazil. But regretfully, again, we have nothing in the visual in the archives to show you. But, all right. So Grant will leave office uh, in, the, uh, in, 1870, in early 1877. Back then, uh, March was the date when presidents changed. And almost and shortly afterwards, the Grants uh, went on a trip around the world. And here you see the map of their journey. Um, you know, Grant had had two long terms in office. Uh, some were better than, you know, some times were better than others, uh, but a difficult presidency in some ways, at least then it was. And so Grant really just wanted to get away from it all. And what better way to do that than take a trip around the world? And surprisingly, but maybe not, the trip started and ended, uh, if you will, in Philadelphia. And so it was in, May of 1877, uh, that the Grants would come to Philadelphia and they would stay at the home of League member George W. Childs. Now, this is an older photo. This is not contemporary to 1877, but it is the Childs Mansion on West Walnut Street in Philadelphia. And uh, the Grants stayed there for a week uh, before they actually departed on May the 17th. Uh, the Childs held a number of dinners or receptions in his house for the Grants, for which they were very grateful. And then on the 17th itself, um, the ship sailed, as they say. Now, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, one of Grant's great Civil War uh, friends, to be quite honest, uh, was in Philadelphia to see the Grants off. And the 
program on the left hand side, as you can see, the Committee of Philadelphia City Councils request the pleasure of your company for the departure of General Grant on the, on the American Steamship Indiana on May the 17th of 1877. Now, uh, everybody was afraid that the Grants would never get to leave Philadelphia because they were so popular and people would just swarm the wharf where they would leave. And so actually the Indiana was anchored downstream off of uh, Newcastle, Delaware, and the steamer uh, Twilight was given the job of conveying the president's party from Philadelphia down to the Indiana. But as you can see on this program, we have two signatures at the top, U.S. Grant, and at the bottom, William T. Sherman. Pretty neat, isn't it? And as you can see from the right-hand side, that this document was, pre was presented to the league by Henry Turry, who talks about the occasion itself. So it's a little nice little souvenir from the Grant's departure. Now, when the Grant's left on the ship were Adolph Borey, <laughs> okay, and another Union League member who we'll meet in just a minute or two. Now, this is the this is a later photograph of the Indiana, but it gives you some idea of what it looked like. It was built in Philadelphia at the William Cramp Shipyard. Uh, of course, the Cramp, uh, the Cramps were all members of the Union League, and it was the biggest shipyard in the country at one point in time. And these were, uh, there were four ships in this class, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And they were the four states because this ship was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad, all right, the American Steamship Company. And so it was only fitting that they named these ships after the states through which they ran. So and then on his travels, Grant, I mean, again, around the world, starting in Western Europe, traveling through the Arabian Peninsula into India and then into Asia. And of course, China would be the point of departure. And while he was in China, on a semi diplomatic affair, he met General Li Hong Chong. And that is who you see on the right hand side. And I, man, I, I show this only because uh, in 1896, Li Hong Chung, who was now the Viceroy of China, would be on a tour of the United States and he would come to Philadelphia and he would be given a uh, luncheon uh, and reception in his honor at the Union League. So uh, what goes around comes around. Isn't that pretty neat? So, uh, so that's Li Hong Chung. And then the Grants came back to Philadelphia. Well, actually the ship uh, would land in San Francisco after across the Pacific, not the same ship, obviously not the Indiana anymore. Uh, but the Grants travel across the country, re attending different receptions, uh, especially in Chicago, I had a big one in Chicago, obviously, because he was considered a son of Illinois, even though he was born in Ohio. Uh, but they came, to, they ended up in Philadelphia uh, on December the, th uh, December, December the 13th. And the next day there was a parade in honor of General Grant, uh, being in Philadelphia, and you can see the general standing on the front portico of the Union League Clubhouse there on Broad Street as the National Guard marched in parade in his honor. And then there was another reception at the Union League on December 23rd of 1879. And here we have the, pro the, the, the program on the left-hand side. And this was really a big affair. And at this point, this was considered the most extravagant and sumptuous reception or dinner that the league had ever given in its history to this point in time. But you can so you can see these invitation cards to various meetings for committees that the league formed just to hold that reception. I thought that's pretty neat. So and here we have on the left league member John Russell Young. John Russell Young was a founding member of the league. He was actually a member of the Union Club, which of course preceded the Union League. And that in those uh, seven weeks between November and December 27th of 1862. John Russell Young was a newspaper man. He was a journalist. And in 1877, he was working for the New York Herald and he was invited by General Grant to accompany the Grants on their tour around the world. And so when Grant returned with John Russell Young, Young quickly wrote a two volume book called Around the World with General Grant. Uh, it's, it's fun reading. I would encourage anybody to do it. Uh, and we have a copy in the library to boot. So anyway, so that's, so again, all this wonderful, another connection to the Union League uh, through John Russell Young. Now, Grant died in July of 1885 and uh, in, in the, in the Adirondacks in New York. And shortly thereafter, uh, the Philadelphia Fremont Park Commission 
Now, the Art Association of the Fremont Park Commission created a committee to erect a sculpture in honor of U.S. Grant. It was already being done in New York and Boston and places in Chicago and places like that. And Philadelphia did not want to get left behind. But in true Philadelphia fashion, it would take a long time. So uh, in 1892, the Art, the Art Association or the Art Commission finally commissioned the sculptor Daniel Chester French uh, to create this equestrian sculpture of Ulysses S. Grant that now stands atop that wonderful pedestal on, well, I keep thinking of it as East River Drive, right? So if you're, you go past the boathouse, you go past Boathouse Row, you'll go under the bridge, the railroad bridge, um, and it'll be on the right-hand side as you go out, out Kelly Drive. So, and it was officially dedicated on April 27th of 1899, the 75th anniversary of Grant's birthday. So that's what it looked like then. This is what it looks like now. Okay. And as you can see, there was even a dinner at the Union League uh, on April 27th of 1899, which was attended by President McKinley. So, so once again, the league featured prominently in its relationship with U.S. Grant. Now, uh, in the early 1890s, the league began a uh, decades long tradition of having a Ulysses S. Grant birthday on April 27th. And so these are the first two, these are actually books. They're not even programs. These are actually hardbound books uh, uh, printed for those dinners beginning in 1892 on the left and 1893 on the right. And we'll take a look at some other ones as well. So this is the 1896 program. It's actually done in leather, believe it or not. It's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. And you can see Grant there as he looked when he was president. And on the right-hand side, you can see the floor plan to Assembly Hall. Now keep in mind, Lincoln Hall didn't exist then. So this, was, this event was held in the annex and Assembly Hall was the Lincoln Hall of its day. And I counted there are 272 places at that, at that large, large table in Assembly Hall. Obviously, it was Lincoln Hall, they'd have twice that many, but nonetheless, it was a sellout. Pretty neat stuff at that. So there were other programs as early 19, early 20th century. You can see the one on the left featuring the Daniel Chester French sculpture on the, on the left, 99. And then on the right, we have the program from 1912 because at 1912, American president William Howard Taft was the guest of honor. And this is Lincoln Hall, great photograph. And you can see William Howard Taft in the background there. Uh, if you look, up above, you'll see the portrait, and you see the word U.S. Grant. Just go straight down, and a little to the right, you'll see Taft, and you can tell Taft because he was so big. Just look for that big, expansive white. And that was William Howard Taft in 1912 to honor U.S. Grant at the Union League itself. All right. Now, the League has its own equestrian sculpture of U.S. Grant, and this was uh, made, <clears throat> pardon me. This was completed in 1868 by the Philadelphia sculptor, Joseph Alexis Bailey. Bailey was not a member of the league, but he did serve on the league's art committees in the 1870s when the league was having those public art exhibits. You know, uh, I, I kind of wish Bailey had joined the league, but nonetheless, this is another great, uh, it's a wonderful sculpture of U.S. Grant. And you can see it today on the second floor of the Broad Street building, right? And then we have these two portraits of Grant in the art collection. The one on the left was done by Anthony Lamour, and it is a portrait that was done from a photograph that was taken by uh, a Philadelphia photographer named Frederick Gudekunst. And uh, the photograph was taken shortly after the death of Abraham Lincoln in April of 1865. And so what's missing from the portrait that we have in the photograph is a black mourning ribbon tied around Grant's left arm. Otherwise, this is a facsimile uh, portrait, if you will. And on the right-hand side, Samuel Bell Waugh, uh, 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 just an important late 19th century artist, or mid to late 19th century artist in Philadelphia, uh, painted this from life in 1869. Uh, I'm sorry, 18, no, no, 1869, at the very beginning of Grant's uh, administration another good idea of what Grant looked like. I think it's a wonderful portrait and a wonderful image as well. So, and then, and on that note, I think I've run out of slides. 
So, so I hope you've enjoyed this little journey through time uh, and the relationship uh, between the Union League of Philadelphia, Ulysses S. Grant, and Philadelphia itself. It's, it's, a, it's a great piece of history and a great piece of Union League history. And so when it comes to Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, have a drink, a birthday drink in honor of Ulysses S. Grant. I think we all should, all right? So on that note, thanks again for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this program. Uh, we'll do it again. Stay tuned. In two more weeks, we'll have something else coming up for you. So, so thanks. Stay well and take care. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>